Greetings. I'm very glad to be here and have this opportunity to discuss with you a development of considerable value not only to this country but also to all mankind. I'm referring, of course, to the development of etheric rain engineering and in particular to its ultimate development where it is carried on aircraft either on helicopters or on light aircraft. This is a considerable advance in weather modification, which up until now has been an entirely chemical process and not too successful. Anyway, the beginning of this goes back to some experiments that I carried out while I was a, an officer in the United States Merchant Marine. And I was assigned to the Matson flagship, which at that time was the SS Maui, brand new out of the yard in Bath, Maine. In the course of the next 13 years, I carried out thousands, literally thousands of experiments in controlling and engineering rain from this speeding ship. And this was all comprehensively documented on videotape. This type of desire to interfere with Mother Nature's normal routine goes back just about as far as written records take us. There are records of rainmakers in ancient Egypt, and here in the United States, we have had rainmakers in Hawaii, the old kahunas, the ancient kahunas who were repositories of considerable wisdom regarding the energies involved, and also some of the Seminole tribes in Florida have had this capability of modifying the weather, mainly by engineering rain. It's not something that is completely novel and new. Uh, my engagement and involvement with all this goes back a long, long way, back into the 1970s when I was doing this out on the high desert of Southern California, utilizing very large, ponderous equipment. And then later on, when I, when I went to the United States Merchant Marine as a radio electronics officer, I was able to do this on the high seas, on shipboard, where I had a pristine environment and none of the problems that were attendant upon operating in the desert. During this period, I became familiar with the work of the late Dr. Wilhelm Reich, a distinguished physician whose life was surrounded in controversy and who died in a federal prison in the United States and had his books and experimental bulletins burned by federal court order. This is a very eminent medical doctor educated at the University of Vienna who was during his initial work in psychoanalysis, the first clinical assistant to the eminent Dr. Sigmund Freud. Dr. Reich focused his clinical work on the enormous convulsive energies that manifested in patients at certain phases of their therapy. He could not believe that ordinary people could be going through this type of convulsive activity unless there was some kind of energy driving the entire process. His focus on the energy that was causing the convulsions led him after a long and involved in attack on the problem to establish that there was a specific biological energy. This involved many years of work to isolate this concept and then establish it as a clinical fact. He called this energy orgone, O-R-G-O-N-E. And in that way, he identified it, first of all, with things organic, and secondly, with the human orgasm, which was the, really the root of his uh, original research. That was the, the thing to which he devoted his life. And he established, after considerable labors, and devoted uh, effort, that the orgone energy was a real physical energy and that you could indeed manipulate this energy in the atmosphere. And he found this out 
in the most strange circumstance imaginable. In Maine, where he had his laboratory, there was a nearby lake, a very large lake, and he observed that there was what we call heat waves going above the surface of the lake in the summertime. That is what we would call them in a general way today. Most people would say heat waves. He said, now wait a minute, this isn't quite right. There is a certain order to the way they move. They move from west to east. They don't move in any other direction. There is a directional component to this. And while he was making observations of this kind, systematically and over a period, he happened one day to step into a depression in the ground there at the laboratory where, where some construction was going on. And there was a mass of pipes that were being cut for installation in this depression in the ground, and they were in water because this was uh, you know, an ongoing construction project. And when he stepped on one of these pipes, he noticed that the energy that was going across the surface of the lake jumped like that. And so he tried it again. He pressed the pipe down into the water and the energy jumped again. He found that he could do this almost like pushing a button. And that is how he discovered the link between the atmospheric orgon energy and the means of developing it. That is to say, pipes. Pipes with one end grounded in water. That is the origin of the device that he invented and gave to the world and which has been extensively used since, even if not officially approved. It's not, it's not politically correct, let's put it that way. And he gradually developed a system of, of operating multiple pipes with a special grounding system into running water. And he found that he could interdict and back up this west-east flow that he observed over the surface of the lake. And thereby, the basis for controlling the weather was laid, in a sense, by a series of fortuitous accidents, as so many great discoveries have their origin. That was the way it was with the discovery of the orgone energy. So I inherited it pretty much in the way that Dr. Reich left it when he died in a federal prison in 1957 and had all his books and papers burnt so that none of the bright people who are around today would have any access to information of that kind. It's very, very powerful and important information. And this uh, droughted world that we inhabit at the present time could normally have that condition substantially mitigated were these methods employed, were they introduced on a general basis. That much can, could, and should be done. However, intervening to preclude all this happening are the political factors involved, political and financial factors. Wherever there is a drought, there are anti-drought measures being enacted and enforced. Almost any government anywhere in the world that has a drought at least tries to do something about that. Even if it's uh, hiring water trucks to go around and cart water to the houses, deliver water from the trucks to the, to the poor suffering people, that much a government must do. They have to do that. But if you hire a water trucking outfit to do this and you have maybe 300 water trucks at uh, uh, four or five hundred dollars a day each, you immediately have a big contract involved with all this. And this invariably happens in any part of the world where there's a drought. That's one of the things that makes it difficult to get all new methods like those I've developed into full general use. It's a, it's a thorny and uh, unfortunately a, a well-nigh universal situation. Uh, needless to say, Attendant upon this entire situation is the question that the people who get government contracts for anti-drought measures uh, see fit to bribe the politicians who are in authority and keep the entire game going that way. That's how it works. And uh, I would hope that within the next 10 years or so, more of that can be done away with and the entire drought situation rectified all over the world 
especially if we further develop these, these methods and these instruments so that we can bring the water down directly from the cosmic expanse overhead in its pure form wherever we want it. We don't have to duct it around or put it into waterworks or anything like that. We just bring it down. It's a, a primal dream of mine ever since I started in this field was to, uh, to tap the cosmic expanse. After all, you might say that God Almighty has stored hundreds of billions of tons of water up there. And uh, all you've got to do is be smart enough to obey the necessary natural laws involved and you can get it down. Get it down and use it. Now all this has a tendency to strain credulity, to put it mildly, that you can, without the use of chemicals or electric power or any other mechanical agency, engineer rain literally anywhere you want it, outside of the world's deserts, which we have yet to conquer and where we do not accept any engagements. It does strain credulity that these things can be done. However, videotape does provide us with the means by which we can bring these wonders directly to you in a assimilable and comprehensible form so that you can see exactly how it is done. And I'd like to say, as a prelude to this, that the devices that we are using on these aircraft are the simplest technological devices in the world today. There is nothing simpler. We are dealing with an empty, hollow tube with a mirror at one end. That's it. But you have to know how to shape the tube, how to tune it, and how to use it. Now let's see it all in the real world. Yes, rain will result, and you are going to see this happen from zero dynamically. Our 23-knot ship is heading east. The ship is east of Honolulu, Hawaii. A gorgeous tropical day. The magical power of time-lapse compresses the events of three quarters of an hour into a few seconds. As we watch our high pressure non-rain day is transformed before our eyes into a dismal day and rain is imminent. We do this now with light aircraft or helicopters. The entire thing is new and revolutionary, but it is, after all, the same old rain. Hello. My name is Trevor James Constable. I'm the engineer that staged and carried out the rain engineering experiment that you just saw. Engineering rain off a clear horizon right over a speeding ship. That's something I've done literally hundreds of times. But always I dreamed of doing the same thing from an aircraft. Trouble was 
the apparatus that we were using at sea was a little too big. Much, much too big to be hung on a light aircraft. When, through research and experiment, we got the size down and the power up, then, and only then, could we go airborne. Ladies and gentlemen, we are involved here in something that is intensely realistic. We utilize hardware, things like aircraft, things that are right down in the real physical world. There's nothing ghostly about any of this. Let's go now to the island of Oahu in Hawaii and involve ourselves directly in a real-world operation of a completely new kind, an airborne etheric rain engineering operation. Let's go. This is the Hawaiian Island Group in the Central Pacific. Our base is on the island of Oahu, illuminated for us here by our laser dot. And this is Oahu close up. For orientation purposes, there is Honolulu, the main city. And just to the northwest of there is the famous Pearl Harbor. And in the far northwest is Dillingham Field, our operations base. The main topographical feature of the island is the Koolau Range. This is a rocky spine running the whole length of the island. The Waianae Range runs over south of Dillingham Field, south and southeast. The operational plan is very simple. The airplane takes off from Dillingham Field and flies due east at 70 miles an hour for no more than 20 minutes. The aircraft then turns away and goes back to its base. That is the extent of the aircraft's involvement. All right. That's the operational procedure. Nothing too, too difficult about that. The question is, how is it that a single small airplane with a single small piece of hardware aboard can generate rain under such circumstances? How is it possible? The reason that this works is that the translator on the aircraft accesses not the air, the atmosphere, but the ether. It accesses the ether and it pushes it backwards. Now since the ether is invisible and basically intangible, in order to get an idea of how this works, we are going to have to use some transparent plastic like this to simulate the ether in the sketch we're going to give you now so that you'll understand how this is done, what the process actually does bring about in the real world. Here we go. There is the ether coming from east to west right across Oahu and right around the earth in tropical latitudes. Irresistible, invisible, eternal. The airplane enters the format at Dillingham Field with translators so designed that they interrupt and push backwards locally this flow of etheric force in the fashion depicted. The airplane leaves the format and it leaves behind an accretion of etheric force right there which draws to itself enormous masses of water vapor from the atmosphere. With the aircraft gone, this mass of water vapor, rain, moves over Oahu and you have engineered rain on the island. 
to make things perfectly clear, the red chip designates the target zone in our operation. And offshore, that blue area there, that is where we should expect to see, perhaps, a satellite from thousands of miles up pick up a plume of moisture that we're going to generate with the aeroplane. Well, that's enough theorizing. Let's go right out now into the real world. But before we do, let's get a solid, objective weather forecast for the day from Honolulu TV. And they're going to tell us that picnic weather is going to prevail over Oahu. Here it is. Lovely. Just wanted to show off. We have some clear skies for you this week. That's nice to see after looking at last week's forecast. Let's uh, get a close look at this. Our surf is pretty much getting nothing. It's uh, two to four in the north. That's your highest surf points. Also the east, two to four. But you look around, there's uh, nothing to do. There's not even a uh, high surf advisory. There's no gale warnings, nothing happening. And if you want to probably go snorkeling or just wind sailing, something mild, the picnic, that's where you go to the beach. And the weather's a good uh, forecast for a picnic as well, as you see a mostly sunny day. And our temperatures will be comfy in the mid 80s southeasterly winds 5 to 15 miles per hour yeah. the plane is airborne at 1:15 p.m. the aircraft will make a single thrust due east for a period of 20 minutes. At 1.52, the plane is back from its mission, the pilot coming in for a debriefing. He reports rain around Waialua and over towards Haleiwa. It has pleased him. And at 2.16, beyond the runway, over towards Haleiwa, we see it is indeed raining, and it is time to get a bird's eye view of what's going on. Now, the best way to get a bird's eye view of what's happening here is to act like a bird. Get aboard a sailplane. Up we go. Heading east. The tow plane in front of us. And there's nothing like getting a few hundred feet of altitude to see what's going on there to the magnetic east direction is rain. This was induced by the thrust of the aircraft. As the tow plane curves us in a climbing turn, we get an opportunity to run a nice panoramic shot of central Oahu. As we continue our climbing turn, we are now heading to the west, and you can see the remains of that nice day underneath this blanket of rain-bearing cloud. With the tow plane gone, we're heading back now towards central Oahu, and we're looking at central Oahu over the top of the foothills of the Waianae Range, facing approximately southeast at the moment, and that is socked in. That area is being heavily rained. I would say at the rate of about an inch an hour, based on past experience. We're at 3,000 feet or thereabouts at the moment. And we're starting to get rain up here. And the pilot has indicated that we will very soon have to terminate this. But our altitude gives us unequivocal evidence of rain engineered into central Oahu. No two ways about it. Now it's beginning to close in on us, and we're in it. Yeah, that's right. I won't charge it for the wash, Bill. <laughs> 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 
Remember today's television weather forecast? Picnic weather. Well, rain came down at the rate of an inch an hour for about two and a half hours in central Oahu this afternoon and led to a small stream and flash flood advisory. So they did indeed have picnic weather in central Oahu, but it was a different kind of a picnic. It has been very, very wet this afternoon. In fact, the National Weather Service has issued a urban and small stream flood advisory. That's for the areas from about Wahiwa up to Haleiwa. Heavy, heavy showers have been coming down here. It's convective activity. Things are a little unstable out there. So when things heated up, that set off a series of fairly good showers out here, mainly in the Poamoho and Haleiwe area, and the urban and small stream is in effect until 8 o'clock tonight. Could be some ponding in roads out there, make driving a bit treacherous, so be careful if you're heading out to that direction. Uh, so and small stream flood advisory is now in effect uh, for central Oahu from Wahiwa all the way up to Haleiwe. Uh, there we go. And here's the shower area right here under that flood advisory. It is in effect until 8 o'clock tonight. It looks like most of that moisture will end after sun Set. All the shower activity uh, coming from a separate area of moisture. Not right now. I'll show you here on our satellite loop, which represents 12 hours. You can see the little plumes develop there. Here's the moisture that's affecting uh, Holly Eva area, hit, being hardest hit the past few hours. Uh, it's been raining so hard that the smaller streams are at the point of almost overflowing. But once again, you can see the little plumes develop. Now she there. is Here's showing you uh, our little area. plume that we created with the aeroplane. She'll put her finger right on it. Develop there. Here's the moisture that's affecting uh, Haleiwe area, hit, being hardest hit the past few hours. Now she's got her finger right on it, and it is directly to the east of Oahu. In other words, it's right in the zone that we disturb, in accordance with the diagrams that I showed you earlier on. That's just about as elegant a demonstration of how it works as one could possibly wish for. Well, that's how it's done in Hawaii on the fringe of the tropics where all this was pioneered. Now, deep in Equatoria, down in Malaysia, the Philippines, and places like that, these processes work with much greater effectiveness and power. In October of 1997, we ran an interesting little operation out of Segamat in the center of Malaysia. Let's take a look at that. Takeoff from the Segamat Country Club is at 2.31 p.m. Our mission is a single 15-minute flight directly to the east right off the runway to be followed by a second such operation provided the weather does not become violent. The weather's response to our thrust is sharp and nasty, putting the follow-up flight in jeopardy. Our number two flight was indeed curtailed, limited to nine minutes by imminent very heavy weather. Uh, with the plane back now at 4.43, we'll have an interview with Captain Bala Ratnam, our pilot, and he'll tell us professionally exactly what he's just seen. Uh, we have a large build-up over there. Yeah, yeah. Over there, and uh, there's one more which is coming down from the south, which is right now building about 15 miles away. Uh -huh. And she's coming in fast because we are having prevailing winds coming in from this direction. Yeah, yeah. So she will be along here quite soon. And the build-up over here will be here approximately in about eight minutes time. So we can see both masses joining together and giving us a, a, a bear. heavy downpour. Good. Thank you, Bella. No problem, sir. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. Came On the night of the 14th of October, we're looking out now from the hotel, of, uh, from the, the seventh floor of the Villa Hotel in Sagamat. And this entire area is now being enveloped in rain, in thunder and lightning. This is the consequence of the operation today. 
and we'll go down to street level and let you see this happening. Outside McDonald's, the main drag, it's a wet night. The courtesy of the men from Singapore. into an area that had been dry for months and was very welcome. The rain persisted through until two the next morning and laid down between two and two and a half inches over the entire region. Our pilot in Malaysia is a Singaporean named Captain Bala Ratnam. He is of Indian descent and he was trained as a pilot in the United States. When we first attached this hollow tube, this empty tube with no electrical connections and no chemicals, to the wing strut of his Skyhawk, I saw him smirking a little. After he had flown 10 or 12 of these weather engineering missions and had made his share of the world's reign, he had different ideas. I was able to capture some of his comments on videotape. Here is Captain Bala Ratnam. Like a normal person, you no doubt had your skepticism about the whole thing. Is that correct? It's very true. <laughs> Never thought it would work. <laughs> Never did. And um, because basically there was what I know about cloud ceiling and causing rain. Basically, you use some kind of chemicals smoke something to make the cloud more dense so that it will basically rain. And uh, having two tubes in my airplane wasn't much of a, uh, how shall I say, it wasn't really uh, acceptable. It, it doesn't seem workable. Out of the yeah. of the man. I see. And um, uh, what's your view now after several weeks doing this? Dangerous thing. <laughs> Never have the tubes on your wings. Um, the results have uh, fascinated me to a very great extent. Um, never did I expect <clears throat> flying on a clear days to have experienced such turbulent weather within such a short period of time and it appearing without any notice whatsoever. Yeah, I see. Now you have an FAA license. You were trained in the States, right? Yes, I was. And uh, I hold a commercial multi-engine instrument rating license with an instructor on single engine and also uh, on instrument rating. Oh, I see. And my license number is uh, 2466946. Okay. What is the thing that has occurred in these flights that has uh, impressed you most with this uh, new method of weather engineering? Okay, number one, simplicity. There's nothing to be thrown out, nothing to be dispersed in the air, and uh, it's very efficient. It's very efficient. And you're convinced of the effects? Yes, sir. That, that comes from <laughs> that comes from first hand. Um, having a dodge weathers, having lightning strikes uh, appear of a sudden, left and right of you. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Kuala Lumpur Kuala Lumpur is the capital of Malaysia and the Kuala Lumpur city and region was in a severe four and a half months drought when I was called as a consultant down there in April of 1998. The first thing I did was load some of our weather guns into a sky van, a twin turboprop transport. It's a big, strong aircraft, and it will carry anything we want to put in it. Made in the UK, essentially it's a flying truck. Twenty-eight hours after I set foot in Malaysia, 
This was the scenario at Subang International Airport in Kuala Lumpur. In the week that followed that spectacular drought-breaking job, helicopters were put into service in this type of work for the very first time. Their use was pioneered in Malaysia in 1998. They proved themselves to be the most effective vehicle yet for engineering rain in the tropics. Attaching the P-guns to the helicopter skids proved to be no problem at all. A solid, secure mount was very easy to make. Getting it approved by the bureaucracy was tough, but we made it. Helicopters take you easily into places that you probably shouldn't go. Here, we're up above the Semenyi Dam in a squall Downdrafts, updrafts, violent weather, not a good place to be. We put a lot of water in this place, but it didn't seem to show on the dipstick. More a job for Errol Flynn. Heavy ponding in the heights of the Semenyi Dam. Heading westward at the conclusion of operations each evening, we would find that we were causing a west to east flow of ether to compress and swing to the south so that it arrived on our port side. You're looking at that now. And this engineered rain walks along with the helicopter, completely in phase with it, drenching the terrain below as we move. In this case, you're looking at about 12 to 14 square miles that is under rain as a result of the passage of the helicopter, just like crop dusting with water. Kuala Lumpur under rain. As we come in for a landing at Subang International Airport, this whole area is still under rain and it's pretty well drenched. Getting back to the hotel was kind of wild. And back at the Renaissance Hotel, they are enjoying first decent rains in four months. This is what I call engineering. And by night, the story was just about the same. And here is the world-famous KL Tower, wreathed in rain and cloud. That's the way it was in Malaysia. This is a brief overview of the stunning potential of airborne etheric rain engineering in Equatoria. These are techniques and a technology that is available right now. 
It does not matter, ladies and gentlemen, what academic people say about the ether. I prefer the driving beat of rain on the canopy of my aircraft because in the final analysis only results count. Only results count. Goodbye. Well, that's the way it's done. Very simply, very easily, with a simple aeroplane or a helicopter, a helicopter is the ideal thing, it does work. And it works in spades, and it works as a system of deliverance for suffering people. Wherever we have used this, we have alleviated suffering. And it's perfectly obvious that wherever it's taken with the intent of relieving suffering, it will deliver the goods. You've seen it. You know that it can happen.